For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall in the mischief. Hebrews tells us, let your conversation be without covetousness. Now that, that's hurtful because all of us are always wanting something. And be content with such things as you have. Just try it. Try it for a day. Try it for three days. Just go three days without saying, I'd like to have, or I'd want, or this would be... No Try three days of being content, not looking or wanting, thinking about wanting or having to have something else. And be content with such things you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And the point of being able to do that is so that it restores your boldness in knowing that God is available. Some of you, no. Look, I've been doing it a long time. You be around this and start doubting God and you, you can't even go to him boldly anymore. There is nothing more audacious than someone in trouble. But there's nothing more pathetic than someone in trouble that won't admit it. Being in trouble is not the problem, but your attitude while you're in, your, in trouble. Number of years back, as typical, my, my son and I had a little bit of a falling out. He just, you know, it's funny, you get a little age on you, you think uh, you're going to tell Pops uh, how things are in Pops' house. But there's just something about our nature when we got a little whippersnapper, you know, got enough corn in the crib going to tell me how I'm going to do things. It's my roof, it's my house, my car's out there, my money. You're, uh, I think you've got things a little crooked in here. Y'all agree with me? Okay. It's his world. It's his trees. It's his lumber. It's the oxygen you'll bring. You're going to tell him how things are. You don't like how we handled this situation. You don't like how we did that. You think he should have healed you. You think you should have done that. You think you should have stuck. All right. Let me just... Because I want to, we're going somewhere, and I, I promise you, if you'll if you'll stick with me, I don't care who you are. This, this this help anybody, so that we may boldly say, "The Lord is my helper; I will not fear what man shall do unto me." Not even the government. Not even the next mandate. Not even that guy trying to get that position that should be. Go down the list. There's a whole lot more fear that you fear that you don't realize when you're not trusting God. That sickness. Let's place our Bibles down. And those of you that want to rise up again. Let's lift up our hands and talk to the Lord around. Jesus, we need you. We need your help. I ask you, God, right now for your help this morning to speak to everyone in this room. All those joining us online, God, that this will help somebody. This will help someone get up from the condition that they're in, that you've got something better for them. God, that you would allow me in the unction of the Holy Ghost to move in your word in the next few moments. This church, God, in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. <laughs> it was a warm early spring morning. The sun on his shoulders felt good. He was enjoying the fresh smell of the spring air as he filled his lungs. Aaron took in the beautiful view as he walked, surrounded by the breathtaking views of Candon's vistas and the red earth. He was in his element. A day of rock climbing ahead, 
caused a burst of excitement and he just walked just a little bit faster. It was April 26, 2003, and Aaron was hiking through Blue John Canyon, eastern Wayne County, Utah, just south of the Horseshoe Canyon unit of the Canyonlands National Park. Aaron Lee Ralston was doing what he enjoyed doing, climbing rocks mountains. The day started out great, but while descending into a slot canyon, a large boulder that was wedged between two walls of the canyon where Aaron was climbing down was dislodged by his movement. It slipped from its mooring places, and as he and the large boulder slid down, the boulder slid over Aaron's right hand, trapping it, crushing it, pinning it against the canyon wall. In just a split second, what had begun is a very fun day of hiking for Aaron had now become a battle for his life. Aaron had not told anybody his hiking plans. Nobody knew where he was going, so no one would be searching for him when he didn't return. Aaron, being experienced, quickly assessed his situation, and he came to the realization that he could possibly die if he was not rescued. He spent the first agonizing day slowly sipping his small amount of remaining water while trying to remove his arm from the boulder. His efforts were futile. He couldn't free his arm from what he estimated to be an 800-pound chalkstone. For three days, trying to lift and create pulleys and a system to try to move that boulder using a multi-tool, generic multi-tool, you guys know what it is. So they're bad enough as they are, but when you get a generic one, they're real bad. They'll hurt you. <laughs> and some rope was futile. And so now Aaron, dehydrated and sometimes delirious, decided to try to amputate his trapped right arm. He experimented with tourniquets, made some exploratory superficial cuts in his forearm for the first few days. On the fourth, fourth day, he realized that in order to free his arm, he would have to cut through his own bones. But the tools he had available were insufficient to do so. With his water completely gone on the fifth day, his strength nearly depleted. Finally, he took a moment to take his video camera and video his last goodbyes to his family. He resigned himself to his demise and death, did not expect to survive the night and slowly carved the date from the rock beside him. Mentally finished, he gave in to death with no help no hope. Death was sure. Aaron wrote his own obituary. Death in a hole, alone, his own heir. Death in his own hand, death. Expecting to die in his sleep, in the darkness, all alone. How many times have we in our own minds thought, well, this is what's going to do me in. This situation is going to be the end of me. I'm done. I, I can't go any further. This is it. I, I, I'm just, I'm too weak. I'm exhausted. I, 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 I can't go any further. My title this morning is, What If I Rise? In Acts 14, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, they drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. The next verse says, Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, you've been there. You've had a situation where you, you, you just hope that someone, a friend in your life, would reach in and lend a hand, but no help came. 
They're standing around. They, they know you're going in a, a battle for your life, uh, whether it's sickness, disease, a financial or a death or some form of tragedy that hits your life. You look for relief somewhere. And here's Paul. He's been stoned with a Middle Eastern stoning. They grabbed his body. He was so limp. They threw him outside the city, supposing he was dead. But somehow, in some way, in the cloud of the incident, Paul's consciousness came back and he looked and saw his friends just standing around him. You've been there. So well, let's see if he makes it. Well, it sure is rough. But the Bible says those three words. He rose up. And he came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now, you have to understand that this same guy, Paul, a number of chapters before, held coats after instigating a riot and causing people to stone another man. Kind of adds to the story you reap what you sow. <laughs> The power of a rise. The power of getting up. With a Christian inadvertently or through the move of God, quoted from a chapter that I'm using this morning. It's one of my favorite verses of all time. Micah 7 and 8 says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. Not if, when. I want to open the door to get some of you off the hook. Y'all act like, oh, I ain't never fallen. I have never made a mistake. I ain't never been dumb. I ain't never done something stupid. When I fall, I will arise. In other words, I didn't lose, I learned. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light. To me, arise literally means to shine, to be causative. In other words, you're going to be proactive, to, to be luminous, literally and metaphorically, the break of day, like, like a, a, the, the morning that starts. You've been through a dark night and all night long, you're waiting for that glimmer. Okay, I made it into another day. It means to be glorious, to kindle. And it, go, it goes a little further, to give light, to set on fire. <laughs> you see, when Micah was written, Israel was in big trouble. The nation was involved in idolatry. In other words, they were caught up in everything. They gave God no regard. The nation was backslid, disgruntled, moody. They weren't serving the Lord or living the way God intended for them to live. God raised up the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Micah. They knew war would come and Israel was going to be in bondage because of the conduct that they had adopted. Micah wasn't necessarily talking or referring to the devil. He was talking and thinking about their physical enemy and dealing with their attitude. Israel appeared to be strong on the outside, but on the inside, decay had set in. You've been there. You've gone to look at a car, and it's got a, from a distance, it's got a shiny paint job on it. It, it looks good. It, it, it's supposed to have this kind of drivetrain in it. It's got this kind of motor, and it's got this kind of differential with this kind of gearing. It. Oh, it's going to be a bad time. But as you get closer, you get your hands on it, and you start to see that the rust had, 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 had eaten the integrity and Oh, this is going to take a whole lot more money to restore than, well, rot had gotten on the inside. I, I've met perfectly healthy looking people to only tell them I'm riddled with cancer. Uh, you have to understand something that Micah's dealing with this. And if you read Micah 7, 1 through 8, Micah, and he uses the metaphor, went to eat grapes from the vine. There's no fruit there. The people at best, to use the term, were briars, thorny and 
irritable and a bad attitude and hardness is all around. Yeah, you ever been around the folks on the outside, they look like the most wonderful Christians, but you get around them and they're bitter and they're woe and they're complaining and they're gossiping and they're critical and there's nothing, no, no faith coming out of their mouth. There's nothing good coming out. Now. Their woe is me and they're negative and God, we're not going to let you get up and sing because because we don't want to hear that song. We we want to hear the praises of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah, yeah, they, they got so bad that they couldn't trust friends. They couldn't trust family. You go read the first eight verses of, of Micah. It's kind of like Job all over again. But in the midst of it, Micah could trust God. He chose to wait on God despite what everybody else was doing. It wasn't over yet. And there's something about God's people. There's something about those that will turn to the Lord. He won't allow his people to stay in darkness. I want to say that we are afforded the privilege as apostolics that just as tragedy strikes at any moment, victory can also come out of nowhere. The gloom and doom mm, melt away and deliverance comes. And that suddenly moment, like suddenly the sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind can come in and it fell on each of them and, yeah, after running and ducking and hiding after the crucifixion of Christ uh, they're in an upper room and suddenly <laughs> victory, victory. The greatest ambush of all time was Calvary. The devil thought he had Jesus and his people down and out, but there was a celebration down in hell and Jesus showed up, <laughs> stole the party favors. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, no, 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 I got to take this. I got something going on. I got something going on over here that you don't know yet. Just, so let me give, give me them party hats and then give me that cake. I'm taking it. I got, I got a church about to be born. I, I, you, 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 wait, you wait till you see what starts happening. Uh, suddenly. <laughs> You know, during the crucifixion, things were so bad that that the, they put extra soldiers around the tomb. They wanted to make sure Jesus was dead and no possibility of his body being stolen. The, the Bible says it went dark. So even the sun hit her face and everything was dark and tears were shed by every follower. No one was running around saying, oh, don't worry, he'll be back. Nobody said that. In fact, they all kind of scattered, afraid. Because when you get to that place where it seems like you've messed up too much and there's no way out, it's at that moment you got to grab a hold of what Micah needed. I shall arise. I refuse to sit in darkness. And can I, can I re reiterate somebody else? I, I talked about Paul saying it, and Micah said it. But I remember that old boy, he just decided, Dad didn't know what he was talking about, and he took off. He, he said, uh, I shall arise and go to my father's house. It's something we got to decide. I'm not going to fit in a pig pen anymore. I may have created this pig pen, and I may deserve this pig pen. And some of us may deserve some of the things we're in. But the wonderful thing about God, he doesn't want to give you what you deserve. He wants to give you the love of a father and pull you out of that. Can I, can I help you? Don't, don't let the devil be the only one talking. Some of you sit there and allow that to go in out and talk and you're surrounded by it. You get negative and so you're, re you're regurgitating what he told you. C can I help some of you? Look, if you know how to talk back to your wife and you know how to talk back to your husband, why don't you know how to talk back to your problem? Your children talk back. You still remember how to talk back. It ain't been that long. Man. Maybe you ought to talk back. Why don't you go and tell him, you know, yeah, I've fallen, but I shall arrive. I may have messed up, but I ain't staying here. Sometimes people stay, make, take so long to make a mistake that they got too much pride to get out of it because they spent so much time getting there. Don't polish that bad boy up. Let it tarnish, toss it out. Get up and go again. I know who the light is. I know where the light is. I'm going to call upon him in the middle of the mess. 
The mess that I may have made. The mess someone may have put me in. The mess that the life just handed me. We're not all promised rainbows and roses. No. We're all going to face darkness and hard days. The question is, is he got a made up mind that I'm going to call on him in my darkness? I'm going to seek him in my situation. Now, you, can, you can't take away my worship, devil. You can't stop me from praising God. You can't stop me from lifting up the name of Jesus. I will look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, because this will change your attitude. Let me tell you something. The church has gotten a bad rap. It has. I, there's been some phony Christians. Well, don't ask me who, but everybody, everybody vote last election. Really? You know there's been some phony politicians. Everybody go out to eat? Anybody ever get a bad meal out to eat? You stop eating because you got a phony cook? <laughs> Man, I could tell you about this wonderful recipe of cheese-coated carbs and you coat it with powdered carbs again. Last night, we were so busy, Erica decided she's going to make dinner, and she invented her own. Let me know what you decide to name that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that, that's a good lady right there saving you, because we've all had one of those things. Just, it's just dinner. <laughs> Proverbs 24 and 16 says, for a just man falleth. Seven times and rises up again. But the wicked shall fall in the midst of. You know, don't rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Let me tell you something. I, I, I hate to break it to you. The politicians ain't going to get it fixed. Your doctor ain't going to keep you alive forever. Your dentist ain't going to make your teeth last forever. Um, you can just go on. There's only one way out of here, and it's the church. Yes. It's what God chose. Yes. Now, if you're tired of hypocrite Christians and you're tired of phony Christians, then why don't you start being a real one? That should always be our attitude as a believer. When I fall, I'll rise. We don't walk around judging people. We walk around looking and loving people. Your will is involved. Oh, okay. I felt that. Quit sitting back thinking God's just going to do everything. It's not all up to God. You've got a say in this. Your choices matter. At some point, you got to stop expecting God to manage everything. You manage your feelings. You manage your attitude. You manage your choices. You manage your thoughts, your deeds. Who put Adam in the garden? He told him, dress it. You know what he said? Work on it. Hello? Work on it. Remember the man with the talents? God gave him five. God gave him ten. God gave him what? The master didn't manage that. You have a hand in this thing if it's going to work. You, anybody ever get a bad mechanic? You're still driving a car, right? Because you had to find a good one. We got to get past this sitting around in darkness and defeat stuff all the time and realize, you know what? I'm going to be the change I need to see. Uh, 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 if there's 10 people that call themselves Christians and we got a world club that calls some people to look away, it's time for us to stand up and call them to look again. When I sit in darkness, I'll arrive. Criticize Christianity. Jesus is still the answer. 
Nobody gets out of here alive. So you better get out of here right with God. If we accept defeat and have a defeated mindset, then our enemy, then the world, the devil gets happy and rejoices over us. But when, when we decide to get up, when we decide to get up and change and to manage the situation, we decide that I'm going to have a different attitude about this thing. Then our enemy has to shut his mouth. He starts taking things seriously because, you see, we are going to encounter trouble and trials in this life. Jesus said we would, but he also said that he has overcome it for us which makes us overcomers, but that means you have to get up. When you fall, get up. Even a just man falls seven times, but we get up, we rise up. John 16, 33, these things have I spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Get up. That was a bad day. That job didn't work out. That relationship went sour. The car broke down. But I'm not going to walk around and blame God. That's the things of this life. This isn't all there is to me. I'm going to live forever with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes. They stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this will I be confident. God turned the whole situation around that looked impossible. How many remembers the story about them four lepers? Now, don't all jump up and down and say, I want to be a leper. Because of typology, you already are. Leprosy is a type of sin. They got four sinners sitting on the outside. Everybody's crying and complaining. Everybody's going to die on the inside. Everybody, oh, oh, stick a fork in the hour. It's over, man. It says in 2 Kings 7, 1, 2, then Elijah said, hear the word of the Lord. You know why it says that? Because even sitting here right now, you got up and came to church, but you just refuse to hear it. You'll hear the sound, but you won't listen to what it says. You won't let it change you. You'll sell out to every bit of junk and every ideology. You'll be, let me tell you something. Stop making people climb over your politics to get yes. to your Jesus. Stop having people climb all over your, try to navigate your opinion, trying to just get to the truth of God's word. Be careful what you decide is going to be important. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, I don't give two cents what your favorite music is or what your favorite culture, subculture, and society. But I'll tell you what, you better make, not make it so important that people got to navigate it and can't ever get to your Jesus because you're so busy about that and not about him. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Y'all still with me? All right. Thus saith the Lord tomorrow about this time. Say a fine flour will be sold for a nickel and two says of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer, so someone impotent, important, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God, said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? I know some of y'all don't believe. We very easily, and a lot of times, fill all these seats up. But it's not important to be at church no more. They'll be at work. They'll be at the next party. Oh, no, wait, wait. Maybe is there a playoff game going on right now? Big deal. If the Lord will make windows and really? It's funny you said windows. The man of God said, in fact, you'll see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. The Samaritans, their land, they're being ravaged by a famine. Enemy troops had surrounded and cut off all sorts of supply. Yeah, yeah, come on now, listen. 
It's just not too far off how we feel sometimes. Go see the doctor next week and let him tell cancer. It's going to change how you think. You're going to re-navigate that sweet stuff at your house. You'll start thinking about, I need help. Oh, I better drop these cigarettes. It's all about attitude. You start rethinking. I, I was talking to someone about that the other day. They're struggling with cigarettes, and I get it. My, I thank God for my wife. But I, I never, I didn't have, that wasn't my thing to struggle with. When my wife come to church, it, it took her a minute to get over them things. We get, hey, look, we get addicted to stuff. It happens. But you hear I said, we, God didn't do that to you. You did it and do it. Manage that thing. God, God ain't going to take this from you. That's what started being a disciple, being disciplined. Christians get a bad name because you turn around. Turn around, you turn around and say, I'm a Christian. And then they watch you with all these vices. Now, here's my defense. Well, wait a minute. If you know that's supposed to be doing that way, why are you doing it? So I'm thankful that uh, oh, people, in the, you guys are awesome. I, everybody has their own struggle. I'm very sympathetic to that. But at some point, you better manage it. At some point, you got to not come under the power of any, Paul said. At some point, you got to turn around and say, you know what? That thing don't get me no more. Right. I remember I had a friend of mine that was out in the woods. He was walking back and forth to his truck, to his campsite. And he got to a certain spot. He kept telling, snagging his, snagging his pants on something. About the third time he got tired of it with some cutters and was walking and waiting for it to happen again. He was going to try and cut it and realize it was a rattlesnake reaching out. <laughs> it was only a matter of time. You let something stick around long enough, pretty soon it's going to drop that venom in you and you ain't going to escape from it. It may not necessarily be a sin, but a poison you keep you from doing what you could have done for God. But right in the middle of all this trouble, the man that got Elijah said in 24 hours, this whole situation is going to change. I wonder how many of us have missed out on so many miracles because we just wouldn't allow God to do a suddenly work in our life. They were starving. They, they were emaciated in flour and barley in just 24 hours. We'd sell for pennies in just a few minutes. The shelves would be full and everybody could have all they want. You see, because we think we see everything. But like this situation, everybody's dying. Everybody's freaking out in there. It's over. And God had four lepers or four sinners sitting on the outside. <laughs> Second King says, and there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit here until we die? Why are you going to sit around in darkness? Why are you going to sit around? Why don't you just shake yourself, change your mindset, and get back after living? There's death in the city, outside, no matter what. Why don't we just get to moving and grooving and get up and stop sitting around in the mully grubs? See, the problem with the officer on the inside is he didn't know God had a whole recon team all suited up and decked out, arm locked and loaded and ready to go do something. Quit thinking that it's over because of what you see. My trust is in God. I don't know how it's coming. I don't know what he's going to do. But if he can take four lepers and deck them out. I can imagine if that guy would have seen us, what are they going to do? Nothing worse than being a leper. Life was a dark place. Everywhere you went, unclean. You weren't allowed in the city. And I see, see, you missed it right there. Their sickness kept them out of the problem. <laughs> Some of you stopped thinking that everything happened to you is bad for you. It may, it, you know what? The flesh may not make it. But if you're right with God, ain't nobody's flesh getting out of here alive. The very thing that excluded them from the city set them up to be used for victory. Outside of the city, lepers, no one gave them any regard. Lepers. 
a death sentence. The disease prognosis gave him the, uh, what have I got to lose attitude. If I, I'm going to die anyway, I'm, I might as well get to living. I'll stop when it's over. When there's no breath in my body, then I'll quit. Too many people lay down in their mind, lay down in their heart, lay down in their spirit because they've got everything bought into this life and they've missed that life. They don't realize eternity's coming. Talk about divine providence. God's got four people right on the outside. No matter how bad the problem you may be facing today, no matter how far under the circumstances you may be, God in 24 hours could turn it around place you back on top. God spoke to Elisha and said, tomorrow, famine ain't going to be here no more. Your current financial situation might be dismal. You might be behind. You might look like you can never catch up. But God could take you from not having to having just what you need in a moment. God is moving, taking his people from owing to owning, from not enough to more than enough, because with God, all things are possible. Now, I get it. Your circumstances look impossible, which is what the Samaritans thought. But I want to remind you what Jesus said, for with God, nothing will be impossible. What God did for those Samaritans, he can do for you and I. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, in 24 hours, you can be back on top if you don't fear. If God is your source, no matter what supply the enemy tries to cut off, God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory because God is yours. So I know it don't make sense for you to pray. I know sometimes you can't understand why I need to be faithful to church. I, I don't know why I need a preacher or I need to read about all. I don't think it's doing anything for me. I can tell you right now, the greatest time of my life is living for God. I, you'll have trouble in the world. The problem is I got an answer to that trouble. We don't live in a dungeon of fear. We live in the household of faith. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful. My household, household ain't surviving. My household's thriving. We're not failing. We're flourishing in the things of God. God used four lepers. Mm. Maybe it's time some of us take the power back off that addiction. Take power back from that bad decision. Take the power back from that old you. That old you, those old mindsets, that old man... I'll tell you what, the greatest deliverance I have found has not ever been from drugs. Alcohol. Cigarettes. Greatest deliverance I've ever seen is people getting their mindset fixed. <laughs> you, can, you, you can get rid of cigarettes and not get up. You can get rid of alcohol and not get up. You can get rid of whatever it is and not get up. But I'm telling you what, if you get a mind change, you'll get up. You got to get that place. I refuse to sit here and die. I'm going to arise and take a chance. That's what the lepers did. I'm going to get up. Let's, let's go do it. They're dying in there. They're dying over there. Come on, let's go do something. It's amazing how God turned that whole thing around and, 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 and flipped the script on anybody and everybody. And we have the pleasure of, of reading the story so it loses a little impact but you got to place yourself in in the shoes of the different characters in the story and realize man what an amazing story but you've seen it you've seen it in the lives of people in this room you've seen it in the lives of people out there mm -hmm. god does great things he's always doing great things he'll always do great things mm-hmm but you gotta, you gotta change your focus. You gotta change what your mentality is gonna center on. Get your eyes off the problem and back on the promises. Replace thoughts of the past with scriptural promise about your future. Our destination is victory. Stop crying about the situation right now. Stop looking at your problem and feeling sorry for yourself. That ain't gonna change anything. It's kind of like a rocking chair where it'll give you something to do, but it ain't going to take you anywhere. 
It's within your grasp if you want it. 1 Corinthians tells us, thanks be to God, which give us such a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Nothing worse than working all these years for a job. Yeah, you, oh, I don't want to get political here, but they, they pulled a fast one on us years ago. Y'all all happy about your 401k plans. The government got their hands on that. We ought to go back to the time when there's a pension. They couldn't touch that. Some of y'all, look, the government will, isn't the answer. It'll never be the answer. The only answer is Jesus. Y'all, I know we got an option. Please go out there, think about it, read about it, vote right. But understand, to get out of here, you need God. Second Corinthians, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. And I, I wanted to spend a minute here. Your attitude emits a fragrance. And all the married folks said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember as a kid, I'll tell you what, I love my mom. Don't get me wrong, but if my mom was mad, you walked in the house. You didn't even need to see her. You knew it. You should have seen us on Saturday morning. Every, every one of us kids wanted to find some reason to get out of the house because that was laundry day. And mom ain't never happy on laundry day. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> you, you see, in Europe, it was different. Y'all spoiled over here. Over there, it's just different how they do it. Anybody ever done laundry in Europe? Oh, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I know why my mom was mad. I'd have been mad. I'd have been, if I'd have known then what I knew, I'd be in there going, Mom, this is the pits. You got to break a window, break a dish, throw, throw them clothes away. You don't need to wash them. You don't need to wear them ridiculous. They, they got these little ridiculous little machines like this, and you wash a little handful of clothes. My mom spent all day washing clothes. You'd be mad too. But I'm still talking about the attitude and how it affects and it emanates a fragrance. Sadly, some of us don't emanate a nice fragrance. You permeate the attitude with doubt, fear, negativity. That there needs to be an attitude of victory that emanates from a Christian. That smell of victory. When people come around us, they ought to smell victory. They ought to, they ought to, you, you, you ought to stop and say, quit worrying about, you know, quit focusing on everything the church facility needs to do and start focusing on who you should be and what you should. You ought to be walking around and emitting a fragrance of faith and strength. You have to understand that world is hopeless out there. The only momentary joy someone gets is a few seconds after buying something. Then the buyer's remorse sets in. Now they got to clean it and wash it and polish it and change the oil and do this and, and buy tires. And now they're working extra hours because they want it. The only victory people can get is when they start to realize we've got a God that loves us. You see, it's an attitude. See, when Paul and Silas, they were beaten. They were, they, 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 they were thrown in prison. The Bible says, it says in Acts 16, 25, they prayed, sang praises, and the prisoners heard them. Oh, what a sweet smell. Best smell that was in that dungeon. Oh, the next time you're in a problem, what's your family smelling? The next time your, 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 your health fails you, what's your family? What's your church? What do we say? The next time you have, man, man, maybe the, the bills weren't paid or this. How, what emanates from you? The Bible says in Daniel 3, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, I kind of wonder if there wasn't a nice fragrance from this. Oh, Nebi, 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 let me tell you. We are not careful to answer you, my brother. <laughs> in this matter. We already know what we're going to do. We're going to smell like this all week long. We don't care. You can play your music. You can do whatever you want. We've made up our minds. We're going to live for God. I made up my mind. I, Paul and Silas had their mind made up before they ever beat them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abel already had their mind made up. What am I saying today? Is there anybody in here? 
That no matter if you fall, your mind is made up, I'm going to get up again. I don't know what got a hold of Paul. He's on a boat, bound for nowhere. It's going to wreck. Hey, everybody, stay with the boat. We're going to crash. Yeah, I'd be looking for an exit, even if I heard from God. Look, I'm just trying to be honest. I hope I wouldn't. Stay with the boat. Stay with the boat. I glad Noah stayed with the boat. Stay with the boat and everybody will be saved. Well, I wonder if they had to send a couple of jokers your side around and go, tie that fool up before he jumps out and dies. I wonder how many of us, we get him a time up, get in the church. You got to stay in the boat. And sure enough, this is when surfing was invented. Go read it. And they all made it in and the Bible says some on boards. They did. That's what it says. And so they're all wet. They're all, they're all cold. They're miserable, but they all lived. Did God not tell Paul they were all going to make it? And so Paul, hey, y'all going to make it, okay? Well, let me get some wood and heat y'all up, okay? I know we're cold. Let's all sing. Hello. Let's all sing. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Y'all sit around. I'm going to get some firewood and warm y'all up because I told you we'd all live. And so Paul, he's going to go get some wood. He gets some wood. And there's a whole bunch of heathens sitting there watching him get some wood. And a snake bites him. And a viper bites him. And like, you're going to die. Why didn't Paul sit down? Oh, my God, I got about five minutes. Oh, I got this situation. I'm sitting in darkness. God, you don't care about me. You helped me save all these people, and now you don't care about me. She emanated a fragrance. He already emanated a fragrance on the boat. He already survived. He's getting that wood. He's still engaged in managing the situation, gathering wood. He's not sitting there, okay, God, I made it. Now light me a fire. He's sitting there probably rubbing them sticks together or whatever they have. They got a fire going. He goes and gathers it. He's involved. Don't find a place and sit down and stop doing stuff. Get in the church. Get involved in what's going on. Gather wood. Clean the yard. Change out the toilets and the bathrooms and the trash. And get involved. Gather the wood. And while he was working and staying busy, Wait a minute, he just prophesied if you all stay but he should have been over here like a king, right? Serve me, I'm, I'm the pastor. I'll put in my time. I preached a wonderful message, you were all saved. Quit thinking we find we forget to a place where we don't need to be involved. That's a death knell to your attitude. It's a death knell to your heart. And it's a sad day when we stay involved in all that junk out there. And we want to quit in here? Oh, God, I don't ever want to stop. I, I don't ever want to be insignificant. I never want to get to the place where I'm not needed. God, give me something to do even if it's taking out the trash. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house. What's he say? I want the right attitude. I want to be involved. I may fall, but I will arrive. I got something I got to do. And so he's gathering those sticks. The last thing he needed was a snake, but that's how that works. He, I don't know how he held his wood and shook it off at the same time. I don't know, but he did. And he emanated that fragrance. Yeah, they're still tending to other people. You want to find out who a minister is? They're tending to other people, working and making sure, living a life. That we're not letting Satan bite us. I'm not going to let that attitude poison me. I'm not going to stop doing what God told me to do. I'm going to stay right back in the middle of everything God's doing. I know you all made it, but God's better than just making it. You'll be warned too. 
Oh, it's all about attitude, folks. What if you rise up? What if you step up and do something? Whatever. Oh, stick a fork and he's done. Not so as you know that here I am. Shake off that beast. Shake off that devil. Shake off that thought. Get that poison out of there. Stay involved. Stay in the things of God. Hallelujah. You know what's funny? It's all he did. All he did was help him to stay saved on the boat, gather some wood, get bit by a snake. They called him a god. Wow. No, he's not a god, but he has a god. You and I should always live on the victory side of life. There ought to be no matter what state I'm in, no matter what, if this is my role, boy, you better watch out. I'm going to fulfill this role better than it's ever been done before. If my job is vacuum in the church, you better watch out. This is going to be a spick and span. If it's my job to teach a Sunday school class, you ain't never going to hear a Sunday school class like I taught. If it's my job to sweep the parking lot, you better watch out. If it's my job that the, we got to start getting back to realize all that time and effort and that junk out there will come to naught. But what we do for God goes on forever. I'm living in the victory. I'm living in the essence of victory. I'm setting forth an emanating essence of victory. Now I'm going to get wordy with you. If you weren't here Wednesday, you're going to have to stick with me. The things that we see in the natural world are just facts. But they're not necessarily truth. The things we face in the natural are just facts. But they are not truth. God's word is truth. And truth transcends facts. It might be a fact that you don't have all the money in your bank account right now. But that's not the whole truth. Uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, The truth is, God's word says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches. I'm going to walk around in victory. But he's going to supply my needs. He's going to take care. I'm going to have a right attitude. Some of you, and let's be honest, you can fix it today. I've been around some of y'all. And you, boy, you got so sideways with God. You cussed right here to me in this church. And I'm cool with that. I am. It don't make a difference if you cuss out there or in here. Because this is the temple. And you, you just thought you were so in a mess that you were done in if you didn't and done in if you didn't. The problem was not God. The problem was not the church. The problem was right here. Come on, I ain't singling nobody out. I'm trying to help somebody today. Some of you got some victories right in front of you. You rise up. Some of you got more to do. You're the one who stuck a fork out. Pull the fork out and keep on going. Rise up. It'll change your family. It'll change your whole life. It'll change. It might just save some people on the precipice of bitterness and loss. My God. It may be a fact that there's sickness in your body. You may even be feeling weak. Right now, but that's not the truth. The truth is, is by his stripes, you are healed. The truth says, let the weak say, I am strong. I'm not denying the fact that sickness may be in my body, but I'm denying it's right for the sickness to stay in my body. That's all right. You don't have to jump and shout about that's okay. That's you. I'm going to thank God. I should not be here right now, but here I am. I may not be here next week, but I'll worry about that then. I'm here right now. I will lift up my hands and glorify God. I'm going to be a leper rising up and leading in worship, leading in victory. You can overlook me, but your victory is going to come through me. Second Corinthians tells us, therefore, we do not lose heart. This is the New King James Version. Even though our outbit word man is perishing. Some of you can't get past that line. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That's why I pray. 
That's why I see God. For our light affliction is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal way to glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Just don't sit around until you die. Don't accept defeat. Rise up and face it. You know what? I'm going to talk back at the devil. He's going to hear me worship. He's going to hear me pray. He's going to watch me stand to my feet, even though my whole body hurts. He's going to see me do things that bother my flesh because I'm determined to emanate the essence of victory. Stand up in the words of God. Stand up and believe the Lord. But sadly, some of you got that grandpa spirit on you. Got that old man on you. Terah, Abraham's father, settled in Haran when they were told to not stop. Some of you got settled in things. You, you, you took the power out of God's hands. Ah, oh, this is where I'm done. They should never have stopped long enough. But regardless, the Bible says he said, settled for a lot less than what God has for him. How many of us settled for a lot less than God has? For him? It says in the Genesis eleven thirty one, but when they came to Haran, they settled. Stop settling. Don't settle. I'm trying to tell some young people today, don't settle. I'll tell you, age everyone, you start writing down what you want. Start showing God what you want. God will bring it to pass. If you, even if your experience is set back, don't settle. Even if things don't go as planned, don't settle. Adjust your focus, get up and go again. Keep moving until you reach Canaan land, but don't settle until you get to that promised land. Don't settle. Fight for your dream. Fight for your family. Fight for your inheritance. Turn around and say to the devil, you ain't having it and you're not having me. Some of us have to stir up that winning attitude. And you need to get back to that place. You know what? If you can get an attitude and get mad when you think someone's taking something from you, most of you get mad is when the devil's taking away God's plans for you. As the cool breeze swept through that canyon, the bitter cold brought Aaron back to consciousness. Shocked to still be alive hours later. Dawn the following day, he looked pathetically at his situation. And then in those early hours, Aaron had what is called an epiphany. She thought that if I could just break my own radius and own the bones using his body weight and torque them against his trapped arm, he could free himself. You may have to lose what you think is such a valuable part of you to save the rest of you. You may have to go ahead, that thing that laid claim to, or you just think is so vast, might be the very thing. You can't climb rocks without that hand. You, you, the problem is, is some of you are risking your eternal life for something. I'm not saying it's not valuable, but you can get to heaven without it. But you may not make it with it. He then painstakingly performed a flesh amputation sawing with that pathetic and I don't know if any of you know about them little multi-tools I got a number of them I've had cheap I don't keep the cheap ones the good ones are bad enough sadly I'm kind of not a good person I've given those bad ones away should have tossed them out nothing worse than a bad tool he was able to use his body weight and break the bones then he began to amputate the flesh took about an hour with that multi-tool and that two-inch dull knife. After he freed himself, he had to make it back to his car. Weak, dehydrated, barely conscious, he was able to climb his way out of that slot canyon, which he'd been trapped in. 
he then repelled, which, oh, this is trying. No, look what he's doing, though he's lost part of himself. Every step is a victory. He repelled down a 65-foot sheer wall, one-handed, then proceeded to walk out of the canyon as the midday sun started to rise up. He was eight miles from his truck, but every step was a victory. Every step was saying, yes, I, I, I thought I always had and needed my right arm, but if it was going to cost me my life, I'd rather lose that than my life. Every step Every step was a victory. You see, it's a whole lot better to lose some things than it is to lose your life and your soul. There's some things we just need to cut ourselves free from that's dragging us down and keeping us trapped. In those few days, Aaron had lost 40 pounds. 25% of his blood. By this time, the the, the, the rescuers were searching for him. They had been alerted that he was missing by his family, and they had narrowed the search to his location. Six hours after freeing himself, a rescue helicopter flew over, and he was rescued. He incurred some damage. He was alive. No, he 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 had incurred some that that uh, it hurt. He lost something, but he saved his life. <laughs> that thing that had trapped him, that that thing that held him, that 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 thing that you know he wanted it and and could even say he needed it so bad. He realized that saving his life was more important than saving his arm. He had come to the point to which he was able to disconnect himself from what he thought was so important. The boulder, his hand, and his forearm had almost cost him everything. And I said it the other day, it is better to enter into heaven maimed. Jesus said those words. Let's all stand. I I want to declare and tell you it's not always going to look pretty, folks. Choices aren't always going to be easy. Oh, it's easy to say, no, I got it. Man, I got to get the alcohol out of my life. I got to get the cigarettes and the drugs. Those are easy. I'm talking about those difficult things. The ones that take a move of God to get you to realize it's been holding you trapped. They're not easy. Sometimes cutting loose of them is painful. Breaking free from them. It was painful, and Aaron will forever carry the scars. There are going to be tears of loss and even some if-onlys. But you have to understand it's, it wasn't a total death. It was just a loss. Mm. Yeah, it was going to leave a scar. There was going to be a mark. There was always going to be something to point to and a reminder. There was always going to be something, but it wasn't a death. It was was not over. It was a great loss, almost unthinkable. No one in the right mind would want to cut off their arm in in any situation, but the situation called for a different mindset. You have to be honest in the situation you're in. You can't go by what I do or your neighbor does. You got to decide, listen, if this thing's costing me my life, this thing might be costing me my wife, my mindset might be costing my wife her spirituality, my proclivities, my, my arrogance may cost me my wife's soul, my babies, my... You may get by, but will they? The situation called for a different mindset. Not a mindset of death, a mindset of survival. We're going to have our losses. We're going to have our pains and injuries and scars and have to lose some things. But this thing you face right now, struggle you're in right now, that 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 war between believing in God and not. 
that trap that you're in doesn't have to be a death. You can cut yourself free. You can find yourself in an altar, eliminating. Take, you know what? You may just have to turn and take your pride and say, I'm done with you. You think that feels like death. What if you actually get eternal death? Because you can't. And that place like Aaron that feels like death will actually become a place of life as you cut yourself free. It could have killed him. It almost did. But rather than everything being lost, rather than the whole person being lost, rather than losing his whole life, he only lost a part. He suffered loss, but not a death. There's an old saying. You have to hurt in order to know. Fall in order to grow. Lose in order to gain. But the greatest lessons are learned through pain. I'd rather spend my life pursuing the amazing than wasted away meandering in the amusing. True life begins at the end of your comfort zone. 